Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leonard Leo, and it is my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the directors, officers, and staff of the Federalist Society to our 2014 National Convention. The theme of this year's convention is somewhat unique for our institution. The goal of our plenary sessions this year is to take the timeless principles of limited constitutional government, which are mainstay subjects for the Federalist Society, and to consider very specifically how they apply to our country's millennial generation. Issues of employment, entitlements, and education are going to receive a fair amount of attention, of course. But more generally, we want to invite you to think about how bright the American dream is for some of the youngest here in the room, or for our children and our grandchildren, or for those young adults we pass on the street each and every day. In this respect, if our republic is going to thrive, we need to ensure that people understand how our dignity and virtuous aspirations depend so very heavily on the rule of law and limited constitutional government. We have bookended this distinctive exploration of our core principles with all the usual activities that you have come to expect and enjoy at our convention for years. Numerous practice group sessions, many opportunities for catching up with old friends and making new ones, the Barbara Olson lecture and the Rosencrantz debate, an invigorating and inspirational banquet in celebration of the Federalist Society and the principles to which it is committed, and of course, to kick things off right now, an opening session that features remarks by a very good friend of the Federalist Society. This morning's opening will be taking us back to Magna Carta, which is so foundational to the principles we all share and that we all try to regularly defend. As many of you know, next year marks the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, and in recognition of this milestone, the Federalist Society is the principal sponsor of an exhibition at the Library of Congress featuring, some of the four, featuring one of the four original copies of Magna Carta, as well as many extraordinary American documents spanning our history that amply demonstrate our culture's link to that charter. I encourage you to visit it when you're here in town. Now it is fitting that we have with us today United States Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia to offer his views on Magna Carta in the context of our American legal culture because he has dedicated his life to respect for limits on the power of the state and maintaining a legal culture grounded in following the law and the Constitution as they are written. Reflecting on how the justice has comported his own life in the law and jurisprudence, I am reminded of how St. Paul described a life well lived to the Ephesians. Stand your ground with truth buckled around your waist and integrity for a breastplate, wearing for shoes on your feet the eagerness to spread truth. Please join me in giving Justice Scalia a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I'm not sure how comfortable I would feel attired, attired in that fashion. But, <laughs> Um, I, I want to uh, say a few words this morning about uh, Magna Carta uh, with the hope of uh, inspiring uh, some of you to uh, go and see the exhibit. I, I haven't seen it myself. I plan to see it shortly, but I understand it's very well done, and it's your Federalist Society that's the principal sponsor of it. Uh, we, we had a, an evening a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, the Princess Royal, Princess Anne, uh, came to Washington in order to uh, kick off the exhibit, and uh, it's a really big do. Let me let me tell you a few things about uh, Magna Carta. Eight hundred years. That, that there are very few <laughs> institutions in the world that lasted that long. Rome, Venice, the papacy. 
800 years. Uh, the, char the, 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 the charter has been to the United States before. England uh, lent a copy uh, to us to celebrate our bicentennial in, uh, in uh, 1976. Uh, it was also here, one copy, the one that's here now, which is from Lincoln. Uh, it was here during World War II. It was kept at Fort Knox because it, it was not only work, its principles endangered in England, but, but I suppose uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, substance. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure it makes sense to talk about the departure of Magna Carta from, uh, from the United States. Uh, it's, it's never really truly left. Uh, it has profoundly influenced, indeed gave birth to so many of the most recognized critical elements of American law. It is with us every day. And so um, uh, I want to discuss how Magna Carta became ingrained in English law and ultimately came with that law to the United States. To borrow from another famous English uh, influence, what's past is prologue. So I begin at the beginning with Magna Carta's adoption. Though the term adoption uh, surely qualifies as a euphemism given the conflict giving rise to Magna Carta, King John came to Runnymede reluctantly. Like his predecessors, John asserted royal powers that, if not truly absolute, we would at least regard as despotic. Uh, John heavily taxed his barons and sold a resolution of competing claims to his royal favor, a practice which in John's eyes was nothing more than administration of the laws. John similarly felt uh, no compunction at staffing purported trials of disfavored individuals with judges of his own selection to secure his preferred result. As a result of all this, uh, King John had to put the matter in today's parlance a profoundly low approval rating. <laughs> By spring of uh, 1215, Many of John's feudal barons, united in opposition, gathered their forces and officially renounced their fealty to the king. This was not only an act of war, but an act of war of the only sort kings of John's era much concerned themselves with, regicidal war. Support from the pope, too late in coming, proved insufficient to shore up John's claim enough to quell the rebellion. After exhausting all other options, John turned to that last resort of intransigent rulers faced with powerful opposition, compromise. <laughs> John met his barons at Runnymede in June of 1215. His barons presented articles of demands in exchange for their renewed loyalty and a promise of peace. These articles of the barons sought to limit John's most serious royal overreaches. After several days of mediation and negotiation, negotiation, uh, one might say, uh, at the point of a sword, uh, these articles became Magna Carta of 1215. It is that Magna Carta, one of the copies of which has been loaned to the Library of Congress. This first Magna Carta lasted only a few months before its unceremonious repudiation. Uh, you will note that I do not call that a failure. A king's concession to the rule of law, even a temporary one, is not a failure. And as you can gather from this 800th anniversary, the future nonetheless worked out pretty well for Magna Carta 
better than for John, at least, who died only a few months later, <laughs> with his barons again in open rebellion, and only his nine-year-old son, Henry, to resolve the matter. Barons loyal to Henry, uh, led by Henry's regent, reaffirmed Magna Carta as an attempt to win loyalty from wavering barons and to quell the rebellion. This proved somewhat successful, and like most successful tactics, it was often repeated. The 13th century brought multiple reissues of Magna Carta and its companion charter, which was called Charter of the Forest, often to encourage the support of feudal barons or otherwise to legitimate claim to the English throne. In 1297, Edward I memorialized the Great Charter in the Confirmatio Cartarum, the Confirmation of the Charters. This version of Magna Carta was entered into English statutory law. Edward's confirmation not only memorialized Magna Carta, but provided that, quote, if any judgment be given contrary to the charter, it shall be undone and holden for naught. It's great stuff. I wish you could write a, <laughs> write a holden for naught. I'll put that in one of my opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Magna Carta was to govern the ministers of the land. It was to bind the government, supreme over mere officials. All of this on November 5, 1297. The notion of a charter as the supreme law of the land, and we have yet to enter the 14th century. It's remarkable. With modest revisions, the following centuries established a tradition of both English monarchs and parliaments confirming, reconfirming, and revising Magna Carta. Most not noteworthy of these revisions came from uh, one of Edward III's statutes, which modified Magna Carta's provision, which read, but for the law of the land, uh, to provide instead, quote, no man of what a state or condition that he be, shall be put out of land or tenement, nor taken, nor imprisoned, nor disinherited, nor put to death, without being brought in answer by due process of law. And that's where we get that phrase from, ultimately. Uh, it's perhaps the best known phrase in American law. And so Magna Carta began acquiring the entrenched durable quality that we come to associate with modern founding laws. By the 16th century, so long ago, Magna Carta was older than our republic is today. It shaped many rulers and legal th thinkers over the centuries, including a barrister and judge named Edward Cook. Lord Cook, one of the great jurists of his era, or any era for that matter, deserves credit for many of the great English legal decisions. But he did commit an all too common mistake for any jurist misinterpreting the scope and nature of a law. Uh, Cook asserted that, quote, Magna Carta is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign, close quote. Uh, if, if that was meant as a description of reality rather than a hope. Uh, it was an overstatement. Uh, Magna Carta was continually reaffirmed by English sovereigns, in part because Magna Carta was more than occasionally ignored by English sovereigns. <laughs> but no matter. King Charles I was just one of the monarchs predisposed to ignore Magna Carta. Waging the Thirty Years' War, Charles I found himself short of what every wartime executive needs more of, money. Having dissolved Parliament in 1626 in order to avoid a trusted advisor's impeachment, 
he faced a dilemma. Magna Carta established a principle that was the forerunner to what Americans in 1776 called no taxation without representation. Specifically, the Charter of 1215 provided in Chapter 12 that, quote, no skewtage or aid, uh, skewtage was a kind of tax, shall be imposed in our kingdom unless by common counsel thereof. Such counsel was impossible without a parliament. So, not being able to impose a tax, Charles I instead demanded forced loans from wealthy subjects, imprisoning many who refused. Five of these refuseniks sought habeas corpus before the king's bench in 1627. The writ was denied on King Charles's prerogative. Cook's understanding of Magna Carta and of the Five Knights case drove a draft of, revol uh, of resolutions against King Charles I. The resolutions focused on two core rights of Magna Carta, freedom from non-parliamentary taxation and freedom from arbitrary imprisonment. When Charles rejected the resolutions, Cook drafted the Petition of Right, which reaffirmed Magna Carta, reasserted the demand for due process of law, and invoked the writ of habeas corpus as wrongly denied in the Five Knights case. In a capitulation reminiscent of Runnymede, Charles, facing the House of Commons and Lords united, accepted and enacted the Petition of Right, reaffirming Magna Carta. Cook's vision of Magna Carta quite literally accompanied the settlement of Virginia. Cook drafted the first Virginia Charter for King James I. It was the good old days when judges not only adjudicated but uh, wrote laws. <laughs> I mean officially wrote laws. <laughs> Cook drafted the first Virginia Charter for King James I, which provided that the colony's inhabitants, quote, shall have and enjoy all liberties, franchises, and immunities as if these colonists, quote, had been abiding and born in England. There can be little doubt that Magna Carta and the rights it included was at the forefront of Cook's mind and of the colonists' understanding of their rights as English subjects. So only finally now, in the 17th and 18th centuries, do the American colonies and their understanding of English law come into view. Before the Virginia Charter in 1606, Magna Carta had been in effect for almost four centuries. The recognized and codified rights of English subjects, including the colonists, gained several more familiar dimensions once the glorious revolution uh, gave rise to the English Bill of Rights of 1689. The English Bill of Rights reasserted the most commonly violated rights of the Magna Carta and also asserted several more rights familiar to uh, the, any American listener. It forbade, quote, the pretended power of suspending the laws or the execution of laws by regal authority without consent of Parliament and insisted, quote, the leveling that, that leveling money for or to the use of the crown by pretense of prerogative without grant of parliament is illegal. That is core Magna Carta. But the English Bill of Rights went further still. It insisted on the freedom of speech and debates or proceedings in parliament, like the United States Constitution's speech and debate clause. It prohibited except excessive bail and cruel or, and unusual punishments, like the Eighth Amendment, and it entitled all subjects, well, all Protestant subjects, <laughs> to have arms, quote, have arms for their defense, suitable to their conditions and as allowed by law, close quote, a forerunner to our Second Amendment. It is here that we meet our second notable jurist, perhaps Cook's intellectual heir and 
certainly the legal thinker that most influenced the American founders, Sir William Blackstone. Blackstone's influence even today would be difficult to overstate. In my court alone, since I have been on the bench, Blackstone has been cited in cases involving freedom of speech, the Alien Tort Statute, the Second Amendment, habeas corpus, and the Takings Clause. Along with Cook's writing, William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England was the most influential legal text at the time of the American founding. And Blackstone unequivocally viewed Magna Carta as the legal equivalent of time immemorial. The articulation of the rights enjoyed by English subjects as far back as is known. Quote, the oldest of these now ex extant, the written laws of the kingdom, the famous Magna Carta. Magna Carta, according to Blackstone, guaranteed that only the authority of parliament by and through its laws could authorize imprisonment or banishment, only according to the law of the land. And of course, the right against taxation without the consent of parliament originated, according to Blackstone, in Magna Carta. The list goes on. If, if I sound repetitive, I assure you it is only because the whole history of these rights returns again and again to the same source. And so it was no surprise that the colonists united against King George III uh, made complaints that were reminiscent of those surrounding the English Bill of Rights, the Petition of Right, and those raised all the way back at Runnymede. King George, the colonists complained, quote, made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries, close quote. This would come as uh, not a surprising uh, uh, manner of proceeding to, to John or to Charles. George, quote, imposed taxes on the colonists without their consent, a grievance more than five centuries old. He courted large bodies of armed troops among the colonists, a complaint raised in the English Bill of Rights. He deprived the colonists of the benefit of trial by jury, contrary to Magna Carta. The list of grievances was long and in many ways deeply familiar to the English. This was a, a, a list written to resound not only with the colonists, who were familiar with Blackstone's and Cook's notions of the rights of Englishmen, but also with compatriots and sympathetic parties back home in England. Both sides understood the invocation of Magna Carta's ancient rights in the Declaration of Independence. And so when the, when the American founding fathers set out to write the founding laws of the United States, Magna Carta weighed heavily on their minds. Indeed, the very notion of a structural limitation upon the sovereign, structural limitation set forth in a written charter, is itself a legacy of Magna Carta. The provisions of the new Constitution and Bill of Rights that trace back through Blackstone, Cook, and the English Bill of Rights to their ultimate source in Magna Carta are numerous. They include the following. The Supremacy Clause, which provides that, quote, this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. To, to give credit where credit is due, however, uh, one must acknowledge that our framers did Magna Carta one better. Uh, whereas the latter was supreme only with respect to the king and his agents and could be revised by parliament. And in fact, the English parliament over the years 
had eliminated some of the rights set forth in Magna Carta. But that could not happen with the American Constitution because that charter was supreme with respect to the legislature as well. If you believe, as I do, that Marbury versus Madison was right. Uh, a second provision uh, of our Constitution that traces right back to Magna Carta, the requirement of Article I, Section 7, that bills to raise revenue must originate in the House of Representatives. The Takings Clause, which requires that takings of property for public use be accompanied by just compensation. The provision of Article Three, Section 2, that trial of all crimes shall be by jury and trial shall be held in the state where the crimes shall have been committed. The Sixth Amendment's guarantee of a speedy, public, impartial trial in all criminal prosecutions. The Eighth Amendment's prohibition of excessive fines. And most profoundly of all, Magna Carta manifests itself in the timeless mandate that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This legacy of Magna Carta, already memorialized in the Fifth Amendment near the time of the founding, was repeated in the 14th following the Civil War. In short, an understanding of the history and hence the meaning of the United States Constitution must begin with Magna Carta. Many of the provisions most familiar to the American people both at the Constitution's framing and today, begin there. Many of the ideals held most sacred in the American imagination originated, or at least were first committed to writing, 800 years ago in the Articles of the Barons at Runnymede. And so it is profoundly appropriate uh, that we should commemorate the 800 the 800th anniversary of that document, which, which we probably venerate more than the English and, and, and have, have always done so, uh, with, with this ex exhibition in the Library of Congress. Um, the Federalist Society has done a good thing in, in being the principal sponsor of that uh, exhibit, and I hope uh, many of you will, will have the opportunity to visit it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice, for your remarks on the Magna Carta, and, and also, or, or Magna Carta, as you pointed out, we do not use the definite article, the. There, there's no definite article. In yes. There. Magna Carta. Uh, and also, thank you so much for coming again to the Federalist Society's national meeting. Your, your, um, your presence here is deeply appreciated by everyone. Uh, it's a privilege for all of us to have had your, uh, your friendship over the years. Thank you very much.